Shalom Uvracha. And as well, I want to remind you that as members of this Sunday school class, it's, it's like we're at home together. In a moment, I'll be sharing some prayer requests with you, and they're members of the family. And so I will add to our greeting, Hargishu Babait, which means make yourself at home. And that means dig in, feel like you're part of the family, because you are, and join with us in uh, not only studying the Word, but letting the Word uh, become a rich source for the way that we live. Now, among those that we need to pray for are Wayne and Andrea Evans. Keep them on your list. Uh, David and Bobby D. Board. David is making good progress. Uh, Wally Reed needs our prayers. He and Barbara are going through a difficult time. He's waiting for uh, the testing test to come back on a, uh, a biopsy that was done and uh, pray for them. And for Tina's brother, as he recovers from a kidney stone, for Shirley Mitchell, who has been having a little bit better days recently, but we need to continue to uh, pray for her. And then uh, as uh, Jean undergoes surgery, on her eye, she had one eye done on uh, several weeks ago, and now she's having the other eye done this week. So pray for her. Uh, let's look to the Lord, shall we? Gracious God, you know each heart, you know each mind. We ask that you would come and minister to us at the point of need. You know every need that we have listed. We ask that you would show yourself mighty to work on our behalf as you bring healing to Wayne and Andrea, to David to Tina's brother, to Shirley Mitchell, to Jean even uh, as she is in the, the process of heading into the surgery. We ask that you, O oh Lord, would show yourself to be mighty to save, strong to deliver, and for your love to be so abundantly clear to each one of us that we can walk with confidence before you in the presence of others. We ask your blessing on our pastor that you would continue to guide him in the days ahead, enable him to declare your word with the power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Now, our lessons this quarter are going to begin in First and Second Thessalonians, and this morning's lesson is in First Thessalonians, the first chapter, and we've actually, our, our primary focus is going to be in verses 2 through 10. Uh, that's all of the first chapter, except for the first verse. And I'm sure one of the reasons they left that out is because they figured you've probably heard all of this stuff before. <laughs> but uh, you're gonna, about to hear it again, that when Paul sent First Thessalonians, which was his first uh, letter, that it is the earliest of his correspondences that have survived and have become a part of our scripture. 
but he says Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. That's the ministry team. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. And when he says grace and peace, they took the standard Gentile greeting, which is very close to the word from which we get grace, and then the standard Jewish uh, greeting, which was shalom, peace, and he used both of them. So he is addressing a mixed crowd of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, he is also indicating his confidence in the church in that he addresses them as the church of the Thessalonians. And the word of means belonging to or coming from. Uh, so the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father. And you'll find later when you read in 1 Corinthians that uh, Paul does not use that phraseology in addressing the Corinthian church. He calls them the church of God at Corinth. And the idea that he's saying the church belongs to God, you need to wake up to the fact that it's not your church. It's his church. But that the Thessalonians were uh, so complete in their understanding and application of the faith that he was not afraid to say, this is your church. This is yours. Uh, it's Obviously, it's God's. But that you have been given the keys. Um, so crank it up and take it for a spin. So, uh, having introduced that first verse, uh, I'm going to read from verses 2 through 10. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Our Father, as we open your word, would you open our minds and hearts to your truth? Would you enable us to feed upon, to feast upon this which is open before us? And would you direct it to us in a manner that brings conviction where it should, that brings release where it should, and 
creates of us, makes us into that part of your body that is winsome, that is loving, that is able to make a difference in the hearts and lives of individuals. Do it, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We always give thanks for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Paul is wanting to make sure they know that they are being upheld by the prayers of this ministry team that is no longer with them, but has not forgotten them. It's not like he's put a check mark somewhere and said, well, we're done with Thessal the Thessalonian church, that we have moved on to other uh, more fruitful areas. No, he's saying that we thank God for you we know that when we were ministering to you, that you got it. You understood it. Verse 3, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. Now, if we were to list those three things, you know how much preachers love a three-point sermon that there it is right there. The things that are remarkable about the Thessalonian church are their work. Um, and I guess it would be appropriate to say their works. That the things that they are accomplishing to the glory of God, that's what he means by work. But how is it that they are accomplishing the work? It's through labor. That's the second point of this message. He's saying it's your labor. It's the effort that you have invested in accomplishing your task that is to the glory of God. And if you take your work and the labor that brought the work into being, that was part of its, its creation, if you will, that what's going to keep it as a working, functioning uh, entity in the life of the church? It's endurance. Endurance, perseverance, that... Uh, to, to be a little bit trite about it, to keep on keeping on kind of spirit. That there are times when we face things that are, are not such happy circumstances, but we don't give up. We continue to push on. And the thing that enables us to push on is perseverance. Now, that would be a pretty good message as it is, those three points. But as you're probably aware, if you have been paying attention to the way that I read it and the emphasis that I placed on those words, it's not simply faith, but it is, or, or it's not simply works. I kind of let the cat out of the bag there, didn't I? It's not simply works, but it is the work that is produced by faith. It is literally, it's a work of faith. In other words, it belongs to faith. It comes from faith. That why are you working? Why are you attempting to accomplish something to the glory of God? It is a faith response to the goodness of God. I shared in Sunday school with the group the story of a young man who 
was brand new to the church, but uh, uh, had been radically saved by Jesus Christ, and he had overheard some men talking, men who were on the, the building and grounds committee, about how they needed to do some plumbing and drainage work around the church. And uh, that's the business that he was in. And one day the preacher was shocked to drive by the property and see this guy out there with his ditch witch and other equipment digging up a storm and laying pipe. And he stopped and said, what's this all about? And he said, oh, preacher, I, I heard the men talking about how we needed to do something like this, and that's the business that I'm in. And uh, the, the preacher said, well, I, I don't mean to dampen your enthusiasm, but you know, the way that that sort of thing works is you don't just show up and go to work that uh, the building and, and grounds committee develops a plan and then we get quotes and then turn somebody loose to do the work and and we appreciate all you're doing here but uh, we would be hard pressed when when you present an, an invoice uh, that because you weren't authorized to do this he said oh preacher I'm not doing this to get paid. I'm doing this because I love Jesus. And that he eventually was given the understanding that there were more concerns that needed to be dealt with to make sure that there wasn't interference between other underground utilities or any future developments. Nevertheless, the point came across. Here was a man who had a work produced by faith. And that faith, um, um, it, it sort of interfingers with the next phrase that says, your labor prompted by love. And labor is the effort the, the, that the the work is what you have accomplished. The labor is how you accomplish it. And so here he was investing his labor for no other reason, not so he could get paid, not because he had a gap in his schedule and saw an opportunity to fill it up, but because he loved the Lord. When he saw a need, he threw himself into the meeting of that need because of his love for Jesus. So this second sort of double element, it's the work of faith, it's the labor of love, and the third element is the endurance that comes from hope. Your endurance of hope. And at the risk of wearing it out, I want to remind you, I'll ask the question again and then answer it before you have a chance to email me, that hope uh, biblically understood is what? It is the confident expectation that God is going to be true to his promises. And by confident expectation, you're absolutely certain that you can count on God to do what he says he will do, to be who he says he will be. And so endurance comes from that assurance 
Now, why do you keep going when you come to a rough patch in life? And there are rough patches out there. If, if you have happened to make it this far in your pilgrimage without any rough patches, good for you. You don't have to pray that God will send a difficulty your way. It's coming. It's coming. Are we blessed? Abundantly. But life is filled with these, these things that uh, when they hit us, uh, we're likely to say something along the lines of, that's not exactly what I had in mind when I was expecting to experience the blessings of the Lord. And yet we discover when we're going through a difficult time that God's blessing is there assuring us every step of the way that we are His. And that assurance gives to us perseverance, endurance, the ability to press on even when we're under a load that is heavier than we expected it to be. One of the things that we will also discover in the process is, and, and as you read it, you'll, you'll come upon it as you need it. But Jesus makes it clear to us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And you might say, well, I never expected to have either a yoke or a burden when it came to following the Lord. That's part of the deal, part of the package. But the good news is, who is your companion in the yoke? None other than your Lord and Savior. That Jesus Christ bears the burden with you. And so, you come away with work of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope. And it is all centered in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, For we know, we, brothers and sisters, the whole family, those who are loved by God, we know that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. And part of the good news is that you have been chosen. I remember years ago hearing Bob Benson, and I don't know how many of you have ever heard of him, but Benson Publishing was started by his father. And Bob Benson grew up in a Nazarene parsonage, and uh, he was a very effective communicator, although the first time you saw him and the first time you heard him, you weren't so convinced. He apparently had had severe asthma as a child and never really became healthy. Uh, I think he died before he was 60 years old. But when he would speak, the love of Jesus would be so, so evident. And he would tell the story of what it was like to be on the playground. And I could definitely relate to it. Uh, but to be on the playground and when they were choosing up teams and that he would be standing there alone 
and one team or the other would say, oh, come on with us. Um, but they always knew that if they're playing baseball that there was a given strikeout right there. <laughs> this was not going to be a good thing. And so that gave him a negative sense of what it meant to be chosen. But when he came to the gospel, and when the gospel came to him, he said it was clear to him that Jesus Christ chose him. And the way that he liked to say it was, I likes to be chose. And uh, the good news for you this morning this afternoon, whatever time of day you look at this, is he has chosen you. Not because he has to. Not with a resignation where, uh, I guess, since nobody else has taken you, I've got to. He has chosen you because he loves you. And that that when you are chosen, that the gospel comes and makes a difference in a way that, that turns the power of the Holy Spirit loose so that you have within you a source of joy even in the difficult times, that the source of joy is ever with you. And the apostle says to this church that he ministered to for only three weeks that he says that he, he's aware confident that the gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power. Now, some people experience more power than others. But do you remember if you if you ever Turn to Jesus Christ honestly and truthfully and turned everything over to him. His power became evident to you in a moment. That the load that you had been carrying was lifted and, and you sensed it immediately. Now, did it make all of the consequences of your previous bad choices go away? No. But that assurance of his presence and his power and his love became a reality and it changed the way you lived your life. Now, if it didn't, I ask you to review what, what you, you did, what, what your circumstances were when you came to Jesus, and ask you to review and make certain that this wasn't just a foxhole confession that if you get me out of this jam, I'll never be the same, but nothing was locked down, never tied down. That uh, if you need to solidify who you are in Christ, he is ever standing ready with arms wide open. Now, Paul goes on to say, you know how we lived among you for your sake. And what that means, he's saying, we had no secrets. 
We were not living sloppy lives. We were living wholeheartedly, flat out, for Jesus Christ. And it was not a game. And you could see it. And you knew it. You became imitators of us, he says. And of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering. And what was happening to the Thessalonian church is almost immediately, they did not have time to develop in-depth spirituality almost immediately upon their turning to Christ that they were being persecuted by the, the leaders of the synagogue. And the ones who were Jews, many were being thrown out of the synagogue. And what that meant is they were being detached from their family, detached from their social connections, perhaps detached from their job connections, all because they had turned to Jesus. And while you may not have experienced something like that, I want to assure you that if you walk with Jesus faithfully, there will be times when you experience a setting to one side at least, if not out and out persecution, the good news is this, that despite severe suffering, the other qualifying phrase here is with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So these two things that seem to be at at odds with each other, that you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And those two are not mutually exclusive. Experience the joy that comes with opening yourself totally to the Holy Spirit. He says, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. And you may say, well, I never expect my faith to be known very far outside Fort Oglethorpe. You might be surprised. You never know who you're going to come into contact with. And if you are living the life, the message gets out there. And when it says the message rang out, this is in verse 8. Interesting thing, the Greek word there means thundered. And that the world stands to be thunderstruck by those people who are walking in faithfulness before Jesus Christ. That when the thunder happens, people are aware of it. I had that experience last week. Out on a job site, sitting in my truck, and it looked like the rain had gone by. And uh, fellas who had been working through the rain, and there had been some lightning flashes here and there, they continued to work outside and uh, the rain started to slack off a little, and I stepped out of my truck and uh, uh, realized that the fellas had all gone to their vehicles. So I went back to mine, and about the time I got there, boom, great big old thunderbolt, not anywhere nearby, but close enough to remind me that, uh, uh, that thunder can get your attention. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is an attention getter when it comes from the hearts of people who are so filled with joy over what Jesus has done in their lives that they openly and willingly share it. When they run into somebody who is downcast, somebody who is scratching their heads about the way that life has gone, 
uh, that, that when the door is open for those who are lost to find the new pathway, the narrow way, that's when the thunder makes difference. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. What? About your faith. For they themselves, Paul's saying, we don't have to brag about you because everybody else is bragging about you. And so what we need to do is live for Jesus and let the bragging take care of itself. Because when Jesus Christ is truly on the throne of your life, people will know. They tell how you turn to God from idols. They tell how you turn to God from Budweiser. They know, they tell how you turn to God from pornography. They know how and tell how you turn to God from that which was not God and this world is crying to hear that kind of message. And once they have received it, then they, like us, will be ready to do what? To wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Gracious Lord, how thankful we are that we can walk in confidence that even in a world of uncertainty, that, that we can be confident that you are coming back and that when you come back, you will save us from the wrath to come. Help us to walk in the light as Christ himself is in the light and use the power of your Holy Spirit to lead each of us into a deeper, more complete walk. And for all that you do in our lives and in the life of our church, we will give you praise in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.